Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on ASD and treatment across the lifespan. My name is Vincent Myers, and I'm the Communications and Outreach Specialist for SPARC. We're so glad that you could join us, and we thank you for taking the time to participate in the SPARC community. SPARC's mission is to build a research community of tens of thousands of individuals with autism and their families who will be asked to register online and share genetic information via saliva kits sent to the home. These data are shared with SPARC researchers and will power important new research that aims to advance the understanding of autism and provide meaningful information and resources to participants. What is a webinar? Before we begin, I'd like to just say a couple of words about how today's webinar will work, in case you have never attended an online meeting before. Today's presentation will be shown in a window on your computer, and the sound will come through your computer speakers. If you're having trouble hearing the presentation, please call the phone number at the top of the presentation browser window. We're recording this webinar and we'll post it on the SPARC website so it can be viewed at a later date. Please be aware that in order to minimize disruptions, all audio except the presenters will be muted for the duration of the webinar. If you speak, we will not be able to hear you. However, you can use the chat box at the left of your screen to ask questions, either technical or for the presenter and only the leaders of the webinar will be able to read them. At the middle and end of the webinar, we will have a few, questions, a few minutes for a question and answer session, which we will draw directly from your questions in the chat or if you sent them via email. Please note that the speaker is not able to provide advice regarding your child specifically, but she is happy to answer other topical questions. We'll also be holding webinars monthly on a range of topics, so, questions on, so other questions can be addressed at those times. I think that's all of the web webinar information I have for you, so I'll pass it off to Pamela Feliciano, SPARC's Scientific Director, to introduce our Hi, everyone. I'm Pam Feliciano, and as a Scientific Director of SPARC and as an autism parent myself, it's my tremendous pleasure to introduce Kathy Lohr today. Kathy has been at the forefront of autism research and autism treatment for many years and currently leads a multidisciplinary clinical team um, as a director for, of the Center for Autism and Developing Brain at Wild Cornell Medicine. Kathy has spent um, her career listening and working closely with patients and their families, and that has helped us better understand the unique and complex ways that autism spectrum disorder presents in individuals. So we just want to thank Kathy for agreeing to speak with everyone today, and um, there will be a question period um, in her talk. So go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kathy Lord, and I'm happy to be here today. And my goal today is to talk to you about ways of getting the most out of an assessment or a meeting with a professional in terms of a consultation. So that's what I'm going to focus on. Um, I need to say before we get started that I have some conflicts of interest in that I do get royalties from diagnostic instruments, um, which I'm not going to try to sell at all today, but you should know that. Um, and I also have research funding from a number of different organizations. Um, I will talk a little bit just um, as it comes up today about findings from our research, but mostly I'm going to try to focus on practical clinical issues. Um, so what I'm going to focus on today is um, primarily um, aimed at parents and caregivers, and then I'm also hoping that, that there will be teachers and therapists and other professionals listening who do evaluations and meet with families and patients as well. And I want to say that my bias is that I love doing evaluations, um, particularly when I get to meet families, um, children and adults who I can follow over time. Um, so I am somebody who likes doing this, um, and so I am biased in that, in that I, I am someone who likes to see families. Um, and I also think I have three sort of sub-biases. Um, one of those is that I like to use different methods. I like to observe myself. I do like to use standardized tests. Um, and um, I also like to see what people write for me and sometimes use um, formal questionnaires. Um, so I like to put that all together and I like to be able to talk to teachers and people on the phone and see the things that people bring me now um, on their um, 
um, on their um, little videos. So I like to get information from lots of sources, and so that's a bias of mine. I also am very interested in how do we use sort of middle amounts of testing. I'm not a believer in like 10-day assessments um, because I think at some point you've just got to move on. But I also feel like there are things that you just can't do in an hour or two. Um, and so that's sort of where I fall is how do you hit the optimum number amount of time that you need to get a sense of what is a child like or what is an adult like. Um, and, and I think it's different with everybody, but I think that's what we're trying to do is figure out how do we be efficient but have enough time so that you can make something. And finally, I think that it really did change my life when I was very young and worked at the TEACH program, which really has a very strong focus on links between assessment and treatment. And the idea that you know, many of us learn to do assessments as trainees where we just did assessments and then we did treatment that was very, very separate, especially people who came from behavioral backgrounds. Um, and they weren't, they weren't linked at all. And I think that you know, when you are in a situation where you're forced to link them and where you're really trying to think about what am I doing in this assessment that's going to have some direct ramification for what, even if someone else is doing the treatment, what they're going to do. And then when you're somebody who is working with a family and you're thinking, what would I need to know in an assessment, I think that, that, um, that we often miss opportunities to go back and forth between those two things. And that right now, that back and forth unfortunately just lies com almost completely on the shoulders of families and caregivers. Sometimes we're lucky because we have a really invested teacher or sometimes speech therapist or someone who hangs in there with the family. But I think that we all need to do a better job of being that link between assessment and treatment because we can get better information from both of those sources which allows us to make, um, make more meaningful hypotheses and plan strategies um, that are better for individual kids and families. Um, so that's where I'm coming from. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about different goals for different kinds of evaluations and visits um, and talk a little bit then on, on top of the idea that there are recognizing different goals. There are some general issues and strategies that, we, that a, a family can do. Um, and then I've, what I've tried to do is have a few kind of handouts that may seem just super obvious to some more experienced families or families who really thought about this, but just so you've got something to sort of take home with you around purposes of assessment, both in terms of what are you trying to get out of this and what kinds of information are you trying to get. Um, around that, I've, I've both tried to focus on issues related to diagnosis, issues around getting information about particular domains like cognition, specific domains like language and motor skills and behavior, um, and then things that may differ across different ages and development. And then I just want to keep reiterating the theme that I think particularly in the United States, we don't do a good enough job in using assessments and visits to professionals to um, uh, get ourselves to think about both what are we trying to accomplish in the short term for an individual child or an individual person, um, and also what do we want in the longer term. You know, we can get so caught up both, I think particularly both in IEPs and in um, uh, you know, the workaday world that we want know what we want you know, for immediate <laughs> goals, but we're often not, particularly with older kids and adolescents and adults, what are we hoping for in five years other than perfection? And we all want perfection for everybody, for ourselves, for our kids, but what are more reasonable long-term goals? Um, so I think that one of the things to do when you're looking for an assessment is to think about what are you trying to accomplish. And I know that a lot of times kids are having assessments not because anybody is asking for them, but because they have to have them through school or early intervention. Um, and I, I think that um, you know, ideally what you would want is you would want an assessment because you want information. Um, uh, 
But the reality is that often what you're doing is you're doing an assessment because you want recommendations, um, you want referrals. I mean, a family may come to me because they have heard that if they come to me, I might be able to get them into a certain program. Um, or they know that they have to have an assessment. You have to have a diagnosis of ASD in order to get into, for example, early intervention. So I think often that is the purpose of the assessment. Um, on the other hand, I think that often while you do that, you are getting information. And I think that one of the hardest things for families to think about is what are you getting out of this, particularly for an older child who's had you know, an IQ test every year of his life. Um, I also think that you want to think about what kinds of information you need. Do you need to know about diagnosis? Do you need to know about your child's cognitive functioning? Do you need to know about specific domains like language skills or motor skills? Um, are you concerned about behavior? And as a child gets older or even not older, are you concerned about specific things like anxiety, um, uh, activity level, attention? Um, and then sometimes, and I think what's best for the professional is, is the relationship that you want to continue. Um, you know, do you want to have somebody that you can go back to? Um, are you looking for somebody that you will establish a relationship with that you can go back to, whether it's in three months or in two years or in five years? Um, or is this somebody that you're flying to, you know, from Dubai that you will see once? Um, and either of those things is fine, but that is a, those are somewhat different purposes. And here I think you also want to consider what can the evaluation give you. And, and I think that it's important here to just think about, you know, depending on who you see and what, um, you can get different things from the evaluation. And even if this is an evaluation that you have to have through school, um, there may be ways that you can get something that you wouldn't necessarily think that you can get. And how can you structure the evaluation or just push the system a little bit to give you something that you might not realize you can get. I mean, you hope that the person um, who is doing the evaluation has some experience in this area. If they haven't, they really probably shouldn't be doing this evaluation. And it's certainly worthwhile to try um, as much as you can to push the system, again, the school system or early intervention to get to, to find somebody who knows what they're doing. You know, I think that often, even in our clinic here, um, you know, people will look up our staff and they'll see, you know, we have a staff of, you know, many young people and they'll say, oh my goodness, this person is only 35 years old, how can they know enough to, to help me? But in fact, you know, a 35-year-old clinical psychologist has often seen, I mean, generally speaking, here in our clinic, a person may see a hundred different patients a year. Um, and so in, in, by the time they're 35, they have seen hundreds of children and adults with ASD. Um, and so, and often they've seen hundreds of people with other kinds of disorders. So I wouldn't underestimate how much experience that means. You know, part of it depends on the quality of that experience. Um, and whether they had any supervision and what were they doing with it. But I think that you can ask um, and you also can ask in what context they've seen it. But I would, you know, give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. Um, and I think for parents, you know much, much more about your child um, than they will. But you haven't probably seen as many children. You probably know several other kids with autism much better than they know any kids with autism. But you haven't seen the breadth. And I think that that is a place where you can take advantage of them. I think the second thing is that, that there is some value in the tests. Because what the tests do is they're modeled after all the little things that we've learned about how children think. And it isn't necessarily that children with autism think just like other children. Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But that's what we want to know. We want to know if it is a child with autism learning language in the same way that another child does. That is, are they, you know, 
over regularizing verbs so that they're adding on, you know, they're they're double coding past tenses by saying I did it. You know, that's a normal error and that's a good thing. Um, um, and so recognizing that kind of thing is really helpful. You know, are they, when they're making errors in memory, are they remembering the things at the beginning and remembering the things at the end and forgetting things in the middle? That's a typical pattern. Um, so the test can help us see, are they doing that or is something else happening? Um, and there is value to knowing that, both whether they're following normal patterns or not. Um, and the fact that we can use these tests that someone else has made means that we don't have to reinvent the wheel or do our own, you know, somewhat often kind of crazy ideas that may come from our own idiosyncratic children. So I think there's value of that. Um, it also means that as testers, we don't have to create everything from the start. Um, and we can create stuff around your child building on something that someone else provided it. I think the third thing is it does give you as a parent or as a teacher, and I think teachers, it's hard to get time off, but it, is, it can be incredibly valuable for a teacher to come watch a child being tested because you will see them do or not do things that you're sure they were able to do or, or really surprised that they're able to do. And I think that's something that doesn't happen enough, particularly in schools, is just that parents have the opportunity to see what their kids do during testing. And then you can say, oh my goodness, I know perfectly well he knows that. Well, that is really helpful to know, partly that he knows it, but also why on earth didn't he say that then? Um, and so I think that that's a, um, another piece of information that is, that is important. Um, I think there are some real sources of confusion when we do evaluations. And part of that is that billing in medicine in general is, is all organized around what do you do when you actually see someone. So billing is based around medical procedures. And so on the whole, although we can bill as psychologists a little bit for what we do when we write or score things, mostly we have to bill for what we do face to face. And the trouble is that the organization beforehand, I mean setting up a room before you test somebody, making phone calls to teachers, reading over reports that people had before, writing the reports after, all of that, all of those things are mostly not billable. Um, and all that organization and thought doesn't get a lot of credit. On the other hand, those are the things that go into making a good assessment. So I think any practitioner is always walking a fine line between trying to be as efficient as possible about what they're doing when they're not with them, but also trying to spend some time doing that. And I do feel like parents often feel abused because you're spent reams and reams of paper that you fill out and then you feel like often nobody looks at it. And what we hope is that people are scoring those forms that you're sent and that people are having a look at that. Um, but I think that what you want to do is give the practitioner as much information as you can that they can look at briefly um, so, that, so that they can put this together. And then ultimately you want to press your practitioner to make individualized recommendations. I think one of the biggest detriments of having online, you know, um, systems now is that many practitioners have, you know, 50 standard recommendations and they just pull from those recommendations and have, you know, kids sit in the front of the room, you know, reduce the noise level and it, I mean, it just, doesn't, you know, and you get a, a standard set of recommendations that means almost nothing. And so if you ask for anything, you should ask for um, individualized recommendations for your child. So I think standard recommendations and things that you can do right at the start going into an evaluation is make a short list of what you want from that assessment. And if you're sent anything that you have to send back, write a one page and really no more than one page and really ideally like three or four sentences of what do you want um, and just put that on the front. I would also make a copy of that and then just carry that with you 
at, throughout the whole assessment. If you are going three times or five times or two times, have that with you every second. Do not count on the examiner to have it in the file or with them at any point. It's just too easy for them to lose it or forget it. Um, and so just, but keep it short and to the point. Um, I also wouldn't be shy about taking notebooks with you. Sometimes we have families you know, that just about show up with a wagon of material, but we can't look at it all. But it's, sometimes it's really helpful to look up a specific thing. And so I wouldn't be embarrassed about that. If you have it, nobody, maybe no one will look at it, but it might be very helpful. I don't think you want to mail long videos because it really is impossible for people to watch those. But I do think that short videos, you know, a few seconds or minutes um, on a phone can really help. I just saw a child, for example, where the parent said, you know, he's here because he shakes his head in a really odd fashion. I tried everything I could do to get him to do it. I couldn't get him to do it. And they could show me you know, four videos of him doing it. And that's really, really helpful. So don't be shy about having that available. You know, in that context, try to be as polite as you can, even if you're extremely frustrated. You know, I think that we all know that you know, in our hospital system, sometimes people don't answer the phone, sometimes things go wrong. And we know it's really frustrating. But if you, if you come in already aggravated, it's, we, it just takes away time from what we can do from you. Um, I think you also really want to stick up for yourself. Um, and you want to keep reiterating um, how you think the professional might be able to help you. But you want to try to avoid telling the professional um, what to do if you can. And I know, for example, we often have families who come and say, well, I want you to do an ADOS. And the chances are very high that I will do an ADOS. But if instead of saying, I want you to do an ADOS, you can say, I've heard you know, people have said that it would be really helpful to have you do an ADOS. That just sounds better. Um, you know, we also have um, we also have families, you know, who say, you know, I want to get into this program, and I've heard that you might be helpful to get into this program. It's it's better to say, you know, look, I've heard this program is really good, and you might know something about it. So it doesn't make a big difference, but just. The more tactful you can be, the better. Because we're all in situations where we're trying to get the most for your children. Um, I think also remembering that while you have a list, um, and having that list for yourself, and being really clear what that list is can be really helpful and clear to the practitioner. The practitioner might have a list too. So sometimes a family may come to me and say, I. Um, have had a lot of testing. I don't want you to do that testing over again. I just want you to do something new. But they may not realize that if I've never met their child, I can't start with something brand new without doing something that gives me a sense of where their child is coming from. So I may have to do some of the things over again just for my sake, even though I know they know already the things that I need to do. Or I may have to have a sense of how good their child's language is. Um, and I may have to hear it even though I can read the test scores. Um, I may have to have a sense of how their child has a conversation even though I can read somebody else's ADOS scores. So I think being aware that you, ha you have a list and somebody else may have a list. Um, and I think related to that, ask the practitioner, for example, if you're watching your child's assessment, how do they want you to behave? You know, sometimes families are so anxious um, that they're afraid to say anything to their child. And other times, families are right on top of their children during an assessment. And you should just ask the practitioner, is it OK if I tell him he did a good job, or should I be absolutely quiet? Is it OK? If, if I'm in the room, if I talk to them, or would you rather that I didn't? Because people can't tell you if they've forgotten. Um, so let's pause for a minute. And Pam, I think you are going to pick some questions that I could answer about just general questions. Yeah. Um, OK, so the first question we have here is, um, are there tools that um, families could use to measure progress in the short term and progress over, over the long term. So are there tools for, for, for doing that? 
Yes. <laughs> I think probably how you define short term and long term is going to differ by the age of the child. So I think part of it is is what what you mean by short term and long term. I think for so let me just jump in and I'll guess. Um, say short term is like over a few months. I think there you want to have pretty specific goals. Um, you know, you, something that you think your child can accomplish, something that they can learn in a few months. So it might be a step towards something. Um, and there it's going to be probably very specific. You know, I want my child to learn, um, you know, to uh, blow me a kiss. You know, if we're talking about a little child or an older child, I want my child to learn to write, write his name. Um, and there it's going to be specific things. Um, I think that, um, you know, it might be I want my child to be able to have a, a conversation on two different topics. You know, so I think there it still would be more like a, an IEP goal than a, than a test. Um, I think for longer term, I think what's really helpful is, is to have goals that are more generalizable so that they're not, they're not tied to a specific person or a specific place. And that's where sort of more formal tests can be helpful. Um, or they can be, or you can use um, more standard instruments where you have a teacher fill it out or even you fill out, you know, does your child um, you know, how often does your child, um, uh, you know, go go places with other kids, or you know, how how is your child completely independent in toileting, or something that's that's more general. So there there are and there there are more standard tools and and more standard sort of questionnaires and um, well more standard questionnaires. Right. So the, the, the um, parent is, is chatting with me and, and they're saying, you know, what about like ADOS? So, you know, obviously ADOS is something that can't be used to measure improvement and development in over short periods of time. But um, I think that's what they're trying to get at because I think for a lot of parents, you want to be able to measure where, whether something's working or not in a general sense, and sometimes you want to measure pro progress that's not tied to like specific IEP goals. Yeah. So um, do you have any other thoughts then? Yeah. So for, I think for the ADOS, I mean, I think that in our clinic we do use it to measure progress over time. Um, it turns out that the severity scores aren't a very good measure of progress over time um, in the sense that they really measure the severity of autism symptoms controlling for level of language. And so those don't, that often doesn't change very much, even though the, your, your child's overall behavior may change a lot. But what we can do is look at the specific behaviors during the ADOS, and those might change quite dramatically. So we can measure changes in things like eye contact and joint attention and conversation and um, play and all of those things. And so in that, and that we really can see. So doing that once a year um, and with small kids even more frequently, even every six months, can be quite helpful. Um, we've been working on a, another instrument which is called the BOSC, which is just a, a short 12-minute interaction. And we're hoping, and that we videotape and we have somebody score who doesn't know the child at all, and we're hoping that that will pick up changes in social behavior over even shorter periods of time. Um, and so far we've just used it with a few kids in the clinic, but we think it may give us ideas about changes, for example, uh, of kids in, for example, early intervention programs. Um, and that we hope will pick up changes maybe in as short a period of time as like three months. Um, so we're, we're optimistic, but so, um, and we're trying to have that be a supplement to parent report, not to replace what parents say, but just because sometimes it's so hard when you're in the middle of it all as a parent to know that what you're seeing is the same thing as what somebody else would see. Right, right. Okay, we have a bunch of other questions, but let's try to get through two more. Um, one person is asking, um, how do you reconcile differences in testing um, between testing that's performed by a clinic 
versus one from a school system, um, and if they come up with different results, especially, you know, if there is some discrepancy on IEP disability categorization or the services that one needs? I, I think that you have to go back and go through, like, test by test and figure out, you know, what on earth is going on. I mean, I think you can't, you can't take it lump by lump. And hopefully, you know, if the parent was there, the parents can help you know what the child was doing. I mean, I saw a child this morning who was seen at, you know, by the school system, and I can't, the report, the school didn't say much about what he did, but the child came out with a very, very low nonverbal IQ. And I just saw him, and he did not do that today. And I don't know why he did it last time. I mean, he was very hard. He really, I think he was just completely unmotivated at school. And today, I was right on top of him. And I was, I mean, at one point, I was giving him pretzel chips. <laughs> and I was eating them myself if he didn't. Um, if he didn't seem to pay attention, which was really not my idea of fun. Um, so, I, I mean, that, I mean, I think that's part of it, you know, and I knew from what his parents had said that if he's not motivated, he doesn't try. So, you know, I think that's the kind of thing you have to do is you really have to experiment. And, you know, part of it is what is your goal? I mean, your, shoot, um, my goal, um, my goal it was to figure out is he really able to do these things, not you know, what is his, you know, IQ, you know, when something is administered in a very standardized fashion, because it just does us no good for him to get a low IQ if he's actually capable of doing something. But I think you have to go through things, you know, very, very carefully. Um, and, and I think that if, if, if you have, if a parent has questions, you know, usually you can figure these things out. I mean, different tests, and I'll get to it actually in a minute. Different tests have different um, characteristics in terms of what they emphasize. And so usually you can figure this out. Right, right. There is actually one more sort of related question. So one person says, my son has autism and is nonverbal. During school evaluations, the evaluator would often share frustration on how low the score results were, but they knew their son was more capable. So does that mean the test was inappropriate? Um, and what what could they recommend, or what would you recommend, or do differently? Um, it's well. I think that when you give a test, you want to be able to get what's called a basal score, which is you want with any test, a child should be able to pass some items on that test. So you should be able to show that the child understands and sh can show you that they understand something you know, a few parts of that test. If they can't do anything on it, then you shouldn't come up with a score. So, for example, on the Wechsler test, things like the WISC or the WIPSI, you can get a score of 45 by doing nothing. So, you, if a child gets a score of 45 and someone says your child has moderate intellectual disability, that means nothing because they did nothing. Um, and that means the child didn't understand anything on the test. It just doesn't mean anything. You know, so you want to be sure that the child gets a basal score. And then you also want to make sure the child doesn't get a ceiling, which means they're not still passing the highest items on the test. Because then you don't know if they could have gone even higher. So it may be that sometimes you have a nonverbal child who is being given a test that has verbal instructions, and they're just never figuring out what it is that they're supposed to do. And so there you need to find a different test and find a test, I mean, it, may, it could still be that the child who's nonverbal is still going to be perform poorly even on a test that makes sense to them. But you want to find a test that does make sense to them and a test that can be done nonverbally and that makes sense to them. And then you need to be able to show, look, my, the child can do everything that a two-year-old can do and everything that a three-year-old can do, but when you get to four-year-old items, he starts having trouble. Um, you, I mean, you need to have that logical progression. And if you can't show that logical progression, something's wrong, and then you need to find somebody who, can, who, can, who has enough familiarity with tests so that they can find a test that does that. 
If you can't do that, then I would say you, you need help because that, that is possible. And I feel like there, there really isn't ever an untestable child. There are kids who don't like being tested and where you have to work really, really hard to motivate them. Um, and there are certainly circumstances where, you know, you don't want to count a score, but it isn't, you know, on the whole, we can usually figure out some way to get a child motivated enough um, and we can find some test that engages a child enough to get them to participate. It doesn't mean that they'll do well or as well as we want them to, but we can at least try to figure out how to see what they can do. Okay. All right, thank you, Kathy. So I think we should move on, and then maybe if there's time, we can take more questions. Okay. So what I was going to, oh, let's see, how do I go forward here? So what I was going to do then was just talk briefly about if what you're concerned about is getting a diagnosis. And in most cases, this might be for a younger child, but it isn't, it isn't always. I mean, we do see kids who are school-age kids who have somehow just never gotten a diagnosis of ASD, um, or even adults who have never gotten a diagnosis of ASD. And hopefully this process of getting a diagnosis has gotten somewhat easier with DSM-5, not necessarily, but because with DSM-5, the American Psychiatric Association's diagnostic criteria, for a diagnosis, you need to have or have had significant difficulties in two areas, social communication and fixated interests or repetitive behaviors. You don't need to have language difficulties or cognitive difficulties, but it's important to know how well you can talk and how much you understand in order to consider your, your abilities in social communication and fixated interests and repetitive behaviors. So you need to know about this in a child because if, you, if a child, for example, is a two-year-old, you don't want to say they have social communication difficulties if they don't understand when someone is sarcastic because they're only two and you wouldn't expect them to understand sarcasm. We have some difficulty still, even though DSM-5 is simpler, some frustrating situations. And I mean, last week I saw three 10-month-olds that people were worried about. And I think the parents were really frustrated with me and our whole system. Because right now it's still very difficult to make diagnoses in very, very young children. Um, partly, we, it's very hard to make diagnoses in children who are not yet walking. And that's partly because our diagnostic instruments um, are based on the assumption that a child can walk. And that's just because when you can walk, you can walk away from someone or you can walk to them. Also because when you're walking, you can hold objects in your hands and your little head is up. <laughs> and so you can look at people. And when a child is crawling, that's harder. And so it's hard, for example, with an ADAS, we really can't tell as much <laughs> if a child is still crawling. We also don't have good, reliable measures of autism, um, even with parent report for kids who are under 12 months of age. So I just saw, an, I saw a child actually who was 11 months old, who would be 12 months in two weeks, who I think really did have autism. And the mother was just like, what is the matter with you? And I ended up saying, look, I think this child does have autism, but, and we will really fight with early intervention to get your child's services. But technically, the instruments um, are intended for kids who are 12 months and older. And that's just a restriction because we don't have data from large numbers of 11-month-olds who do and don't have autism. These issues are also true for older kids who have, or, and adults who have very significant um, limited mobility, you know, somebody who has very severe cerebral palsy. Um, the other thing related to this with DSM-5 that can get very confusing is that to have a diagnosis, any kind of diagnosis on DSM-5, whether it's depression or anxiety or ADHD, you have to have an impairment. That is, you, something has to be wrong. You have to need help. And it doesn't have to be a whole lot of help, um, but you do have to have some need for help. You might need you know, a little bit of help. Um, you might need sympathy. You might just need 
um, support, but some kind of help. Um, and so what has happened in ASD is you can have a history of social communication deficits. You don't even have to have them currently. Um, you can have a history of repetitive behaviors, but something has to be awry now in order to continue to have in order to have an autism diagnosis. And I think that can be frustrating. Um, but it, but that, is the, that is the formal definition by DSM-5. So by having, though, these somewhat broader characteristics, and now what I'm referring to are these three areas within social communication, social reciprocity, nonverbal communication, and then relationships and or the, the ability to adjust your behavior to social context. We're more dependent on a clinician and or a parent to come up with examples than we were when we had DSM-4 that just laid out specific criteria like peers or shared enjoyment. This means that if you have a good clinician or parents who are very good reporters, you can come up with examples of of a deficit in social reciprocity or a deficit in nonverbal communication. And so there is more potential here to recognize individual differences in people with ASD. And I think this is good. I hope this will help, for example, in girls who might get missed. Because you can say, look, this girl has a beautiful smile. I mean, she may look like she has good eye contact, but in fact, she does not have good social reciprocity because she doesn't really understand friendship even though she talks about the, her, the sisters in Frozen. So I think that this does give you more options, but it means that you need to go through these examples with the clinician, and the clinician needs to take the time to talk to a parent or observe a child um, and make sure that they go through and get examples to meet these criteria if you're trying to come up with a diagnosis, particularly in somebody who, where a diagnosis is not clear. And generally, that's the two extremes, either a child who has very significant other delays or somebody who has um, very milder problems. Also, again, this can be presently or by history, as long as there's still an impairment. So one of the, one of the situations we frequently see people in is young adults who have always had difficulty but who have gone away to college and have struggled and come back often because they are depressed but really probably have always had ASD. Um, and at this point, they do have an impairment, although they might not easily meet criteria for autism. But if you go back through their history, they would have met criteria and they now have an impairment and so they can meet diagnostic criteria. Same thing is true. So here are the areas in terms of um, repetitive behavior and restricted interests. And again here, you have to meet or have met criteria in two of these four areas. But you don't have to do all of them at the same time and you don't have to do all of them now or any of them now. But what you have to do now is you have to have some kind of impairment in some way. And that impairment might be, again, a college student who is, who is depressed and can't get out of bed because they're so overwhelmed um, being away at school. But in the past, um, they had uh, resistance to change, repetitive behaviors, and sensory problems. So what I've tried to do just to try to be more helpful, sorry, I just clicked the wrong thing. Um, Oh, so you can get this information, again, this goes back to my plea to use multiple modes, is in lots of different ways, through the parent or caregiver report, from structured questionnaires, like things like the SRS or the SCQ, from less structured interviews, things like a Vineland or a, um, a, a questionnaires or packets, structured interviews like the ADI, you can get information from teachers and therapists, from phone calls, um, from something like the ADOS or the AQ or ASQ. Um, and I think, oh dear, you also want to ask your evaluator, how will you get this information? Because I think that 
sometimes you may see controversies. Um, and this came, this came out, I think, initially when DSM-5 first came out, with people saying, well, we have data that shows that many people won't have these we don't have data showing that people with autism meet these criteria. Well, that's because the clinician just didn't bother to get that information. So I think that if you have a clinician who says, look, this person doesn't have a fixated interest, you need to say, how did you try to find this out? And if you didn't bother to try, then you're not going to have this information. So I just made, oh shoot, here, I just made a um, basically a handout that I thought maybe you could, will help somebody here where you could just say, what do you want the evaluator to know about yourself if you're a person with autism or about your child um, in terms of these areas? And then what do you want to know from the um, e evaluator or what do you want help with in terms of these areas? And again, the idea that the more you can just clearly help the evaluator focus on what you know and what you want help with and what do you want and what um, and share that information the better off you'll be if you can work together and I think that um, spark group had said to me that we'll post these somewhere where you can download them so you're welcome to use these however you want now another source of confusion I think has been that every diagnosis in DSM-5 has had to have these levels of severity. And our committee on DSM-5 really fought against doing this because we just thought these are going to be misused. And I think that has been totally true. Um, there is no empirical basis for these levels of severity. And in fact, there have been several studies come, that have come out that have shown these are nothing but trouble. But already some states are using them. And we were worried that Either some states were saying that if you don't have a certain high level, like up here, in terms of needing a lot of support, kids weren't going to get services. Or if you don't move from level to level, which would show that your treatment is working, that you wouldn't get support. And so you're sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't. But what I think I want to show you is just that the idea of this was to try to put parents and um, caregivers to give you maximum flexibility to try to show, to show that um, the idea is that individuals with autism do need support and that they can get support and that we're not trying to take away support if it is resulting in, ha in um, progress. Um, and that also there is a range. I mean, there are, there are dimensions of severity that go from really, you know, all of us who can be awkward at times um, to people who can be very awkward but do not have ASD to um, ASD um, uh, that ranges from really quite mild up to severe. But that we do not want to take away support from somebody who is functioning because they have the support. Um, and I hope that we will, move, we will make better progress than we have in terms of ways to quantify this severity. Um, just to add a couple more things here, I think that in terms of cognition, the most commonly used measure is IQ. And we have to be careful here because there are changes in IQs over time. IQ does not really mean the same thing in a person with autism as it means in anybody else. I mean, most IQ tests, you know, are based on representative samples um, across the population, which means mostly sort of normal people. Um, and normal means between 80, 85, and 110, 115. Um, verbal IQs especially are not very stable in autism. So most young kids in autism have really terrible verbal IQs. But many children with autism will have very low verbal IQs, and those IQs will go up. Um, often they will start going up between two and three, and for many of those kids, not all, I mean, I wish it was all, but many of those kids, they will go up steadily from two to three and three to four and keep going up. Um, it's very, very important that they go up. Um, and so that change between two and three 
is as important as where the child's score was at two. So what happens between two and three is more predictive than anything else. Um, and where the child is at three is far more important than where the child is was at two. Um, and then moving forward, again, it's that trajectory that is most important. But often people just look at the absolute. Um, to say that a child has a low verbal IQ, a child with autism, um, does not mean very much when they're a preschool child. Um, but it, overall, eventually, it does have significance, but not, again, in preschool years. What you want to do is look at that change. Nonverbal IQ is more stable, but it also may change. Very few kids have nonverbal IQ scores that go down. The one exception to that rule is that there are some kids who get nonverbal IQ scores at the sort of low end of normal, sort of in the 70s, and if those kids do not learn to speak, which is rare, those scores may go down. But mostly, if a child gets a good nonverbal IQ, meaning sort of 70 and above, that score will stay up and may get even higher. So if the score is pretty good, that's good news. If it's, if, it's in, if it's not so good, that doesn't mean bad things unless it's very, very low. So we really have to be careful in interpreting IQs. And subtle differences um, may make a big difference. Um, and we don't want to just uh, interpret these things with hatchets because they, they do mean somewhat different things. Um, there are lots and lots of ways, I think as the question earlier addressed, of measuring IQs. And what we're really looking for is agreement across tests. Some tests are much more appropriate to be used with people with ASD. And some examiners are familiar with these tests and some are not. Um, sometimes people don't have access to tests that are very good to use with kids and adults with ASD. And, and so they just can't, they've never heard of them, they don't know what they are, um, and then we, it's, it's hard. And you do need to try to reach out to somebody who can help you. So I think just a few standard pieces of advice in this area. You want to separate out verbal skills from nonverbal skills. If someone gives you a full scale IQ, immediately you should stop them. Because almost never is a full scale IQ meaningful. Um, a full scale IQ is averaging verbal and nonverbal. And with some brighter kids, that may, mean, that may be fine. But most of the time, it is not helpful. Even within verbal, you want to separate out expressive language, which is your ability to speak um, or communicate with language, versus receptive language, which is your understanding. And those two things are usually highly correlated, but they're not the same. One may be better than the other, even if they're related to each other. In nonverbal skills, you also want to be sure that you know the difference between nonverbal problem solving when you have to do something quickly and when you can do something more slowly. And a lot of um, nonverbal problem solving tests are timed. Um, and so you want to know what happens when you're not timed and when you are. And then you also want to know what happens when there's a fine motor component, like when you're moving blocks around, and when there isn't. Because there are kids, a lot of these things are related, but there's sometimes kids who are just klutzy, even though they know where things have to go. They fall apart if they've got to get those blocks together and in the perfect place. And other times when kids are better when they're moving things than when they just have to point. So what you're looking for here is agreement across tests that are logically related to each other. And you're looking for this across tests both across time and also across tests that measure slightly different but related things. I think here you don't want to get too caught up in minor differences across subtests. You know, sometimes I see neuropsych reports where someone has had, you know, an average score of 100, which is you know, absolutely normal, and then they say, oh, someone got a 90 on this and 105 on this, and that probably doesn't matter. Also, for a bright child, if they got 130 on one thing and 118 on another, that also probably doesn't matter. But what you, do, what you want to know is if a child is get, if they're getting a 70 on one thing and 110 on something else, that's really important. 
and, and you, you know, you can use the psychologist or even, you know, it may be an OT or a speech pathologist or somebody in their specific area to try to help you interpret these results. Okay. Um, and here again, I just made a little handout because I think that you can think through this and think, what do you want to know about your child or again, even as an adult, about your own abilities or about a teenager's abilities? And what do you know already that you want the examiner to know about these abilities? And then I added in here, just because we don't have all the time in the world, um, uh, related uh, academic skills, um, vocational activities, and general behavior, which is a lot of different things, I realize, but just to, just to keep us moving. So let me stop for a minute and see if there are questions about this. Question, well, there are a few. Um, one of them is, is there a list somewhere of what such assessments are more appropriate to use with kids with autism? Yeah, I can make a list. I mean, there, I think that there are, you know what I can do is maybe I can make a reference list to some of the best chapters that talk about different tests. Maybe that would be helpful. Sure, that would be great, and then we can post it. Okay. Um, there is another question. Um, so this is interesting. So someone writes, um, if they feel their son's behavior is not really experienced, is it better to halt at home intervention and wait until someone experienced is available or not? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, I, you know what I would try to do is see if there's any way you can find somebody who's more experienced who could even train or supervise somebody who is less experienced. I mean, it's hard because sometimes less experienced people don't particularly want to be taught by somebody more experienced. But it's hard because you don't want to wait forever. Um, but um, I, I mean, it's, I, and I think you can have someone who is less experienced but who can do fairly well if someone just guides them. You know, I mean, you can, you, people can muddle along with some help, and you don't have to be perfect. But I think probably what they're experiencing is a combination of someone who doesn't know what to do and no one is helping them. So I would think if you could just find somebody who would help them some of the time, maybe they could do better. I would hate to just give up on having anybody help them. Right, right. Okay, that's good to know. And then one more question. How often um, should kids or individuals with autism be tested or assessed? I think, it, I think it depends on age. I mean, I think little ones, you should probably have some kind of evaluation at least once a year. Um, uh, and I think that for a really small child, you, you want to see progress. So I think if you're starting with a two-year-old, you may not need to have a real evaluation after three months. But if they're in an, if they're in an intervention and they're not changing, um, after three months, somebody should be doing something different in that intervention. And so if, you may not need an evaluation to tell you that, but if you do, you should, you know, if, if nobody's doing anything different, I would bring in the evaluator. Um, I think I would probably keep doing that once a year or around once a year up until and around the transitions. I mean, here, you know, kids have they switch programs at three so that you're, you switch from early intervention into a, into the preschool at three, and then you switch into kindergarten at five. So I think all of those often involve evaluations. Um, I think that you probably, you could go to a year or two years, but I think that you also want something around eight or third grade um, in most cases because school gets so different around third grade if you have a child who is potentially reading. Um, and then it, then it may not have to be every year. I think it depends around the child. But I would think every year or two. Um, um, and then again, it's around transitions. I think that you're, you're thinking about what do you want to know and what do you need to know it for. Um, and then again, I think it's also how often do you need to see the person, you know, are you trying to maintain contact with somebody that you know? And how often do you feel like you need to see them and they see you? I mean, I mean for me, I'm not going to forget somebody if I don't see them every year if I've seen them three times. Um, so it may be just how far do they have to come and, 
you know, are they sending me, if they're sending me Christmas cards, that may be enough. Um, on the other hand, you know, it, it, it may be that they have things they really want to show me. Or if the child has a lot of behavior problems, it may be worth it to check in and see what's new and are there things that we can work on. Okay. Um, there are a couple of questions about interventions that you recommend. So um, some folks are asking, are there interventions that you think work better to help um, less verbal individuals communicate? There's also a question about ABA and whether um, there are other therapies that you would recommend besides ABA. Okay. <laughs> um, well, those are broad um, questions. Um, you know, I think I for for nonverbal kids and adults, I really feel like any way that helps them communicate is valuable. And I tend not to feel like there's you know you need to take you need to have a system for each person, but rather you you pick different contexts that you want them to communicate about, um, and figure out how how um, they might best communicate in that context. Um, and so it may be that there are certain contexts where um, gestures um, and voc vocalizing may be most helpful, and in another context it may be helpful to use something like a picture schedule, and in another context it may be helpful to use an iPad or something like an iTalker. Um, so, and I think that by observing what does the person already do now, and then thinking really carefully about what would get, what would make the person be able to communicate more about what he or she would really like to communicate about. Um, sometimes you can have more effective communication there. And also, what do they already communicate about? And how do they do that? And then can you expand that in some way? Um, you can get sort of more mileage. Um, but I, w I wouldn't say, all right, this person's going to sign, and then they and we're not going to use an iPad, or this person's only going to use an iPad, because I don't know anybody that uses an iPad in every single situation that they could. Um, I think that for um, ABA, I think that ABA, you know, is at the root of almost everything that we do. But I think that it's. I think that there are often ways to be more natural about it and to present at AB, to use ABA principles in a way that engages a child in a um, um, in a more playful way that's more fun, um, and I think that and that generalizes more. Um, so I, it's not at all that I'm moving away from ABA principles, but just that I think that we can. Um, particularly with little kids, I think that we can um, we can keep them happier, and we can have things be um, we can we can maximize the engagement. It can be um, it can keep them more part of their families and um, support their parents and their siblings more, um, and um, also uh, really their communication more um, when we make the the sort of ABA and the behavior that we're trying to get them to do more part of a sort of ordinary interaction. But I think that's hard. I mean, it's much harder to do that than to have, you know, discrete trials that you just sit down and pump out and do over and over again. So I think the field is moving in the, in the direction of more sort of naturalistic developmental behavioral uh, um, interactions. Um, I think that also the reality is that a lot of interventions at our school and what we, um, you know, and teachers, and that's, that's good. And what we need to do is try to figure out what we, can we do in schools, and then how do we make social communication um, more of a part of what happens in school. I mean, some teachers are just super good at it, doing it without even thinking about it. Some teachers think about it a lot, and some teachers don't think about it at all. So. How do, how do we have that happen? Um, and then I think how do we support families in doing other things like getting kids in exercise, getting kids in um, other activities without totally wearing themselves out, you know, driving around to one thing after another. Um, so I think that a lot of the things that serve as therapies for older kids that are after school are probably not really therapies, but we need to figure out how to how to make that possible for families because it they really are as important as therapies 
um, but they don't get the financial support or the um, the kinds of supports that we provide for you know somebody who's getting a you know physical therapy for, who's who's had a stroke for example and we should we should provide that. Okay. Um, what are I know I'm conscious of time, so um, if you want to just finish the slides, and then if there is any time left, or you have time to take a few more questions, we can, or we can just try to um, wrap up. Okay. All right. I will just wrap this up. Oh, I got to go back to an arrow here. Um, so I think that what I was going to do is just finally t uh, end up by talking about older children and adults. And I think, I think that what I've, I've talked a lot, uh, hopefully it is relevant to older kids and adults, but I think what is a little bit different for when you're, we're talking about getting information for, for, from an evaluation for older kids and adults is that priorities are really quite, are even more varied for older kids and adults than they are for younger kids. I mean, I think with younger kids, I think most of us would agree that we're trying to get kids to talk. We're trying to get them engaged, socially engaged. Um, we're trying to get them to behave in ways that they can participate in as much as possible in regular school and to behave themselves enough so that they can do stuff um, you know, in the community um, and play. Um, and then with older kids, things are more divert, you know, are, are going to be more diverse. And so we're thinking about, you know, some kids are going to be in specialized classes. Some kids are going to have, are going to have very clear academic goals. Some kids aren't. Some parents are very focused on getting their kids to have high school diplomas and other people, um, that is not a goal at all. And other people are torturing over whether that's important or not. Um, I think we're still, you know, uh, you know, I still, I think, struggle myself with, you know, how much should a child be pulled out of, you know, high school physics to have speech therapy, um, um, you know, so the sort of standard s services that are sometimes available, and you're like, why am I doing this, or why is he doing this? Um, and then, just as I was saying, like extracurricular goals, you know, should we, you know, push this boy to be the mascot of the football team or not, you know, is this a good thing or are we really setting him up to be teased or what, what are we doing? Um, and I, then I think particularly as you move um, into high school and then out of high school into um, college and, and later education, what, what is, you know, how are we helping people set up a reasonable quality of life? and you know, how do we um, incorporate, I think, pleasure. I, I think even in high school and middle school and sometimes later elementary school, I just worry that some kids with autism go through the whole day without doing anything that they really like to do. Um, and, and is anyone planning that, you know, just saying, you know, you're, you're in third grade and, you know, you're not looking forward to recess and gym. And so, what, you know, what are you looking forward to? Um, thinking about what do you want to communicate about if you're, you know, 14 and in a middle school 12 to 2 to 1 class, um, you know, doing the same stuff you've been doing for the last, you know, 12 years of your life, you know, what are you engaged in, what are you motivated in, how do we keep kids moving? Because I do worry that some kids get so sedentary and on the one hand we're worried about them being agitated but we also worry that they're sitting and then how do we maximize independence? So I think that these are somewhat different um, priorities um, than we have often for the little ones. Um, and I think that the, you know, how do we get information about these priorities from an evaluation? And I think I've sort of come full circle here, but I do think one of the ways we do for, for kids who do um, have academic skills of some sort, I think we can get some of that information by seeing them do academic tasks. I think, though, what's hard here is that so much of the focus in school often is just getting kids through academics. So we're like, you know, I want him, you know, I, I, I have a seventh grader and I want him to take that test and I'm going to get him to have modifications so he can take the test. And really, probably a more important question maybe not for a seventh grader, but for a tenth grader is what is, he, what is 
the way that we have to modify that test telling us about what he's getting out of this whole experience um, and what does it tell us about how he problem solves, how independent he is, and what are we, what should we be thinking about, what is he going to do next, and what can he do? Um, and I think that our, you know, our, our whole clinical system, at least our center here and our school system has not matured enough to help, you know, to know really how well to help a student in that in that situation, you know, how do we help create a niche for a, a young person who has real skills but may not be easily going to graduate from high school unless we really, really tiptoe through high school courses. Um, and the same thing for college. Um, and how do we um, help this young person communicate what he knows to us without you know, and, and do we just say, all right, I do want him to get a high school diploma so that he can get into some kind of college just so he has a college experience, which seems like he's entitled to it um, so that he um, can move forward and then I'm going to worry about what on earth he's going to do with himself just like I would any other kid or do I really try to think about what he needs to be learning. Um, and that, I know I'm sort of babbling here, and that's what this middle phrase is here, which is that we have to separate out what do we do to get a child through the school system from what are we actually trying to get them to learn. Um, I think that there are more tests, though they're not a lot these days, but I think that there are tests like the TTAP, which is from TEACH, which looks is not very helpful with very, very bright people, but can be very helpful looking at, um, you know, how much can someone focus and how well they can stick to a task. Um, and, and some people with autism find it, you know, amazingly relaxing <laughs> to do a task that they, they, where they know what they're supposed to do and can just do it, um, and also some of the adaptive scales. Um, so I think we're moving toward being able to do this. Um, and then I think even with adults, and this is just narrowing our focus even down more, we need to realize that, again, we're really talking about such a huge discrep discrepancy among different adults in the circumstances that they find themselves. And we're really, you know, we need to recognize that we're, we're in a quandary of how do we give different people um, maximum independence and decision-making power, but also recognizing that they aren't here the reason they're here is because they need help. And so how do we do that and how can we help people be pre as prepared as possible to use us as professionals as well as we can be used. Um, so I'm just trying to finish up here, but I think we do need to also remember that some of the comorbidities that people with autism experience can be as restricting in their lives as the autism. And that certainly includes aggression, which is not that common, but certainly devastating when you have somebody who's very physically aggressive. Um, but more common are ADHD, social anxiety, OCD, um, and depression. And those factors, at least in my experience, are you know just are very common in people with ASD, and and not surprisingly, you know because people with ASD have social deficits, and so. Um, you know, social deficits are a, are a risk factor in all of these factors as well as the, whatever the neurological uh, dysfunction that is associated with ASD is um, that are linked with these same factors. Um, I think that these factors are, just like everything else, best evaluated through observation, the report of somebody else like parents and teachers, and self-report. And so I think you are back to this sort of multimodal um, assessment, um, but I think sometimes you do need to do different things than you would do in a standard testing where you're, you know, bringing someone in and doing cognitive testing or something like an ADOS. And I do think we need to be careful that these things don't get missed. And that there is a temptation to bring somebody in and do an IQ test and an ADOS and then say, oh, by the way, are you anxious? And then say, all right, I'll send you to the psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist may just jump right straight to medic medication and it may be more helpful to do a more careful, um, have a more careful discussion both with a person um, with ASD and with parents or family or whoever else is involved 
um, about what does this mean and where, where do you want to go and where is help best done. And then finally, I just wanted to end with, I, I also do think that, you know, one of the amazing things about people with autism, I mean anybody, but people, is that everybody's got some kind of strength. I mean, the, I saw a little boy today who was seven who, um, for some reason, I don't even know why I did it today. Um, oh, he, he referred to a um, carrot as a crayon, and then repeatedly throughout the assessment, he made jokes about uh, crayons as vegetables, and it was just got hysterical. He just built on this joke throughout the whole two hours of assessment. By the end, I was like, he was serving me crayons with butter and crayons with maple syrup and telling me that I better eat my crayons before he saw me the next time. And, but I think the sense of humor is just pretty amazing. Um, and I think that, you know, that is another thing that we don't build into our um, you know, our tests, we don't score it, but it's there. You know, I think some people, not everybody with ASD have, have wonderful fine motor skills. I think that, you know, I, our, we have an um, employment program here and our former, my former assistant now runs the food service here and says that our, our people are the best people in the food service because they come to her and tell her they want work. They can't take it when there's no work. Um, instead of sleeping in the locker room. Um, you know, I think many people with ASD are very bright. Um, we have, people can have wonderful visual spatial skills. They can be curious. They can have better, far better attention to detail than I do and honesty and all kinds of things. So I think we do want to remember that and just be, um, always remember we are looking for the best as well as the worst and that a assessment is not just a search for deficits. And then I just want to thank you all for listening and thanks for everybody that I get to work with and I hope this is helpful. So I'll stop there and Pam, um, I'll do whatever you want me to do next. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Kathy. We have a couple more questions. Um, one is if you um, see a child, are you able to give or is the clinician able to give a strong recommendation for placement? Um, in this case, the parents think their uh, vocational program is better for their child, um, but the school um, recommends continuing academic programs. So, I mean, uh, at least what I've learned through the years is we can't, as a psychologist outside of the school system, I can't give a recommendation for a specific placement or the school have a heart attack. What I can do is recommend types of placement and with a logic behind it. So I think I can, I can recommend, you know, I, um, I can say I think this child is much more suited for a vocational placement than an academic placement and why. I mean, that is the kind of thing that I, I mean, I don't know their child obviously, but that is something I could do. Um, you know, and, and I think, I mean, I was recently saw a child that I've known for a very long time where I, it was the, actually the opposite and the parents did not agree with me and so he just tiptoed around the whole thing but where the parents really wanted him, they want him to get a regular high school diploma which I cannot imagine how on earth he can do and I just ended up saying, you know, I, I well, I didn't say, I just said I, I think you know, he needs, we need to figure out how he can, I, he, we need to figure out how to get him through the day in a way that he can um, gain things from his courses. Um, and that's, that's all I, I can say. But I, you know, we, I think a psychologist can say, I think this child would gain more from vocational experiences than academic. That, that is something a psychologist could say. What we can't say is, I think this child should go to school A or go to, go to school B. We can say, I think a child could go to a school that has the following characteristics, you know, one, two, three, but we can't say label it A and B because that's sort of considered unprofessional. Okay. Um, there's another question here where someone is asking if you have experience with individuals with autism and gender nonconformity. Um, and I guess if there are ways that resources that you could recommend. Yes, I do. Not very much, but a, a few. Um, uh, 
you know, I think that in the, the only, I mean, I can say three families that, that I've worked with. We've, we've worked with individuals who felt like they were, um, you know, born, born in the wrong, you know, born in, the, in a different gender than they really should be. And in one case, um, the young man was born as female, and we recommended that the family go to a gender clinic, and, and she, or he, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to get, I'm going to probably offend everybody, but the, um, transitioned and went to high school as male um, and worked with a clinic, at, you know, at our university, which was a, um, a, a, a clinic there. Um, we also worked with a young man who um, identified as female. His family was very, very distressed about the situation. Um, and they eventually, which we, we felt like they should support him, but they eventually hired someone who um, uh, sort of convinced him otherwise. And um, I'm not sure, I mean, we saw him afterwards, and I'm not sure what happened after that. Um, and then actually I know two other people um, who I think have transitioned um, and felt happy about it. Um, so I, th I think it does happen. And I, I don't know if it's more common than in the general population. I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert about it, about it at all. So I think that um, I think that what I would do is probably find, you know, in most major um, universities, there is a clinic that specializes in, in transgender, that working with transgender people, and I would probably go there or have somebody from the autism clinic call there and talk to them about the situation, and then I would probably try to get the two people together. Um, because I think that at least with us, the, the, the person that I, where I, we were most involved with, people were very happy to work with us. And we, we really um, were the background, you know, not the, um, you know, but we were, we were available in the back. Um, and I, I think we were happy to do that. Okay. Um, we have one more. Um, a pe someone is asking, are there any plans to like better align um, school psychologists and medical psychologists because the differences are difficult for parents to understand? I don't know. I mean, I, I yeah. think that the, I mean, often the school psychologists actually have better training, I think, in working with children than clinical psychologists. So I can I I think as a clinical psychologist I can say that. I think the part of the problem um, so um, but I think that part of the problem is how the time and the funding is is distributed. Um, you know, I don't know um, because many, I mean, many of the school psychology reports I see are very well written, and the school psychologists have spent a long time with kids and have done a really good job, as far as I can tell, writing things up. So I, I don't have a lot of criticism for school psychologists. You know, as a clinical psychologist, I think that the, the main um, role, I think I play as a clinical psychologist is that families can come to me and I feel like my job is to um, start with the family and go from there. Whereas I think the school psychologist comes in from the school, not that they're not working with the family. Um, and so, but I, I think, you know, in general school psychologists are getting more competent with autism all the time. Um, but it really varies from school system to school system. I think that's, I guess, there I should be careful because um, um, there's just a lot of variability. And I know that in, in various places I've lived, some of the school systems put a lot of pressure on the school psychologists um, to do and say a variety of different things. So it really, prob that, is, that is probably, that is something that's 
that is different than a say medical psychologist where nobody you know no one's telling you what to say or do right okay well thank you so much for your time we really really appreciate it and we've gotten a lot of positive comments today right. thank you thanks yep. everybody so um, stay tuned for upcoming SPARC webinars. On September 14th, Gary Mayerson, an attorney dedicated to representing individuals with autism and related developmental disorders, will be presenting. Um, there's a short survey that you'll receive when you close out of your window, and the handouts that Kathy talked about will be available for downloading. And the recorded presentation and PDF will be available on our website in a few weeks. So thanks again, and thank you to Kathy. Bye-bye.